of all of this. And then it walks you through the entire thing. Here we have to how do it. I stop the color of those certain things here. You can get into all this. Use that problem with some stuff to use it. And if you guys know, you can go at it once it's all set up. So the idea is to get you set up. Okay. All right. My share is fine on this on the table, so we're kind of key. I'm all going to that. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, that's the camera. Okay. So, as far as the mobile, mm -hmm. you can see it. I'll come to this one. Also come to this one. So, yeah, no, if you log in here, it's a lot. So, we're going to use all the Yeah, you have a lot of That's all you need. You have a lot of why is the here? It's okay. There's a way I can start off. Okay. Hi. Hi, Yep. Although there's a lot of feedback, you might want to turn the audio off for that. All right. Let me check that. Well, so go to slice on here. Okay. So we should. Yes, I um, need to set up the camera so you we start with the five minutes. Sure. Mm -hmm. we'll yeah, it works. Okay. It's off as well. Okay. I would prefer to have this like grab I will just run. This is your Zoom link, right? It should be. Yeah. Uh, are you the host here or there? That's the host. Okay, got it. Yeah, there is one now. So, 
ますけど So do you want to come? I mean, do you want to do this? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, since I'm going to take this, I'll take you through this and you can take it first. I can take the handle of this. Yeah, because yeah, I don't want to mention how long it would take and how many questions. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I want to get an installed pattern and get the library to practice and stuff. Once that is done, if they get fine, I'll take them to the kingdom and just cut it out of how it's in the books and how to convert those to the books into the next three months installed. I won't ask this all right now because the book has a lot of people have to go. They just wanted to yeah, know just how. And it's all the Python and show them what a problem looks like and how it looks like. You mentioned it was going to be a living house. Yeah. Yes. That's it. That's the plan. So you can go first when we start in a few minutes. And then yeah, just have a few minutes. I might have to be. Um, just so whenever that is, I'll just give it a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to go out of pizza, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, Daniel? Yeah, can I? Can I get that number now? 571. 571. 2501. 9615. 9615. Is it password protection or something? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think it's password. Yeah. Make sure it's unmuted. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Oh, that's the laptop. Oh, that was the laptop. Oh, I think I'm doing the recording. 
So what was that you know, conference thing you were talking about on Sunday? Email or code or something? Like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this the sign for the door for new The sign, the first sign? Mm. Oh, I think she was in the workshop. Oh, you were talking. Mm. So, hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Larry Zin, I'm a faculty in the age of the third year. We need four parties. So, I'm excited for this talk. So I decided to come today as well because in our last meeting, a lot of talk to us was about the hardware, about the quantum. So I decided to take maybe around 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how many questions around, to tell you a little bit about the, the quantum hardware that we are using for computation. And then uh, after that, we, we will have other discussions during our meeting. But then probably we want to spend more time on the <clears throat> software part of things rather than the hardware. But I wanted to say a few words about this, the hardware so you don't feel like you, you, you have a black box that you are programming. You have some idea of what is inside that you are connecting to and you are programming. It will give you an idea about what are the limitations, why the number of, for example, uh, the qubits or the trans quantum transistors we have is not large enough. And that gives you an idea about the engineering challenges. Hopefully, I can talk about a little bit about that. So obviously, to learn about the quantum hardware, is, you need to take at least uh, five, six, seven, seven different courses to understand what is really happening there. I'll try to summarize and talk about a few basic concepts today. And if you're interested, we will we'll, we can talk about this in, in our future meetings as well. And then uh, you can let me know, I can come and join the meeting uh, later on. But if you're also interested, we, I am offering this course in the fall, uh, the ECE uh, 595 course is called Introduction to Quantum Science and Technology. It's a 500 level course, which means both undergrads and grad students take that. Uh, don't feel like because it's 500, it's, it's very difficult. It's not, there are a lot of examples and a lot of uh, homework that you need to do, but in the past two years, almost everyone who took the course got an A from that. So if you are interested, you can take that course and then you can, you can see if you're interested on the hardware side of things. So this is going to be mostly on the hardware on quantum technology in general, whatever that quantum is. So a third of that course is going to be on, on quantum concepts and quantum physics. The third of that is going to be on qubits. And the third of that is going to be on quantum computation and communication, the application. So that's just one thing. So today I'll talk a little bit about some of these concepts, and after that, how we'll walk you through. Hamza, sorry, <laughs> Hal couldn't join today. So Hamza will walk you through some of the uh, QCI uh, programming and how to install Catalyst and things like that. Some of the things we have gone through that before, but for some of you. I think it might be new. So we want to make sure you have the Catalyst and Python installed because in two weeks or so from now, we will have a webinar by uh, QCI that 
but they will walk you through some other examples. So it would be good that if you have it installed so you can have uh, some kind of interactive session then. Uh, yes, I think that's what I wanted to say. Any, any question before I start going through a few concepts? If there's any question, don't uh, hesitate to drop me. There is no stupid question. Right? That's the whole point of this meeting is that this kind of club is that we teach each other what we know. Right? We have people from computer science, from mechanical engineering, from electrical engineering, from physics. So the purpose is that we can kind of look at this kind of problem from a different angle. But as I said, before we dive into programming, in the software side of things, I'd like to give you some background about the quantum concepts and the physics, the hardware, and then we can take it from there. Yes, yes. just a quick question. Okay, okay. Um, that's pretty. You have a quantum computer currently that we can like, work on, and um, maybe like, can I ask like where it is located as well? So, most of the quantum computers that are available they are available on the cloud. So it's not physically here at Purdue, right? Mm -hmm. So we all connect with that via the cloud. So some of these, like for example, the two platforms I'll talk about today, one is uh, the Regetti. Mm -hmm. So Regetti, IBM, Google, they all have their own quantum computers and you can connect to it via the cloud. These all work based on a same platform. It's called superconducting platform. Mm -hmm. There's another platform which is called ion based. And this ion based quantum computing, there are two other companies working on that. One is IonQ, and uh, one is um, like the name. So these are other companies that we do have access to IonQ and Regetti and D Wave and some of these machines on the cloud. So it, regardless of what the platform is, the interface is gonna be the same. So you don't need to know really what is the hardware you're working on exactly. Because as, I, as you will see here, the, the hardware looks completely different, right? They look, in, in one side, we have RC circuit, similar to RC circuit, right? It's a solid state thing. And in the other case, the hardware, is, they are atoms, they are gaps in, in vacuum. It looks very, it looks very different, but when it comes to programming, it's agnostic to that. You don't need to know what is the, the hardware you're connected to. Sounds good. Uh, no, I was just saying the opposition. No, we are actually go no, that, 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 that right there. <laughs> right, yes, that's it. Right. Um, I'm quite familiar with quantum mechanics. You are, you're, you're not. I'm quite familiar with quantum mechanics. I'm still lost at the class where quantum computers like connect with normal quantum machines to do as well. Surely that we have. So if you if your background is physics, you probably have heard about quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, and all of that. When it comes to quantum computing, you don't need any of that to explain it. Most of that you don't need to explain, right? You don't need to write wave equations to understand it, right? The vector analysis is enough to understand how quantum computation works. Right. And uh, the, the, the connection is that in both cases, I mean, in general, when you say quantum, quantum computing, it means that everything we do is probabilistic. And that is the, the, the core concept in quantum mechanics. Right? You talk about the probability amplitude, you talk about the wave function. It's all about the probability, right? And when you bring that concept to computing, right, the computation becomes probabilistic meaning that you don't have a deterministic uh, process. You don't start from bit one and that changes to bit zero, that changes to bit one and so on and so forth. And now I have the answer, right? You have a bit zero or one with some probability of zero with some probability of one and that evolves. And, then, and so the, the, the computation is, the definition of computation is very different from what we know today based on class. So the, the, main, the main connection is the probability six tau. So, the, so it doesn't have anything to do with wave function. Yes and no. I mean, yeah, I still can write a wave function for my cube. It's a very simplified wave function that has only two states, that has only two degree of freedom. Right? When, you, when you typically talk about the wave function, you say, okay, I have a wave, and this wave function has different degrees of freedom. 
different properties. My wave function explains everything about my, my system, right? I don't need that description. I just need a very simplified description, a very simple uh, system, which we call a qubit, to do this computation. Right? Yes, you can take it further, you can write the entire wave function, you can make it very complicated, but then at that point, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. And you, ideally, you want to make the system very simple that you can understand and that you can do computation. Maybe we can touch on some of that, but this, the idea is that, uh, well, what kind of platform you are picking to do that? Maybe I, can, I will touch on that. Should we get started? Good. By raising your hand, how many of you are from physics or, or EC background? Electrical engineering, physics, mechanical engineering, computer science. Okay. So if, if you are from, from all of these degrees I've mentioned, you probably have had a course on electronics, on, on electronic circuits. You know what is the resistor, you know what is the inductor, what is the capacitor problem, right? So in almost any electronic system that you have, you probably have, yeah, you do have some spikes. So basically, these are a few topics I want to talk about today. Right? One is how do we get from a bit to a qubit and superposition? Right? And I talked about the two platforms, ion-based and superconducting qubits that are used for building a quantum computer. There are many other ways you can do that. I'll talk about this. And then if I have time, I'll talk about data operation. Good. Most of you have seen something like that. Problem, right? And, and, and electronic circuit, a very simple basic electronic circuit that is everywhere in your microwave oven, in your phone, and everywhere, right? You have this LC circuit, right? Inductor, capacitor, is an offset, right? You put some energy, some, some current inside, and then the energy oscillates between the magnetic energy and the capacitive energy, the charge energy. The energy oscillates between the conductor. And the capacitor and, and the inductor. Let me also is back and forth between these two. Assuming there's no resistance, you don't lose anything. It just keeps going back and forth between these two, and you have oscillation. Right? And this type of oscillation, for example, in your microwave oven is what cooks up your food. Right? Now I can, I can measure this oscillation. I will see, oh, the, for example, the voltage across this one or the current going through my LC circuit is oscillating in time. It's high, up, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? There's some certain voltage here, some certain voltage here, right? Let's say that when voltage or current is that value, I call it zero. When the current is that value, I call it one, right? Just some definitions. Now, in this kind of circuit, we typically have many, many, many electrons. Right? We don't have one electron, we have many, many electrons. If you want to find out how many electrons we have, roughly speaking, you can do this, right? You can say the energy of my LC circuit is given by time. Right? Let's say simply if you have a one watt microwave oven, right? This energy would be one watt. The power would be one watt. Multiplied by one second would be the energy you have in one second, right? So now if I have one watt, or let's say one in one microsecond, I want to know how many electrons are also in that second, right? I multiply it by one, by, by a, a microsecond. I have the amount of joule of energy I have, right? Quantum mechanically, I can write this. You probably have heard about the Einstein equation, right? MC squared or H bar, H bar nu from the Heisenberg. So here, even if you don't know that, you don't need to worry about that, right? So n is the number of electrons we have inside. Roughly speaking, if you divide this by h bar omega, you get the number of electrons that you have inside your circuit also, right? There are trillions of trillions of electrons oscillating inside your circuit because then this guy is about 10 to the negative 34, right? So for the microwave oven, for example, if you look at that LC circuit, to have a lot of electrons inside, right? So if I ask, okay, let's measure the voltage across this capacitor, you see this. If I ask what happens here, well, we say oh, all of my electrons are either inside the capacitor or inside the, all of the energy is stored inside either here or there, right? 
And if I ask what happens here, you say the other way around. All of the electrons of energy has moved from one to the other. If I ask what happens at this time, what would you say? The electrons are traveling. Say again. They're traveling between. Yes, yeah, some are here and some are there, right? Let's say half a trillion are here, the other half a trillion are somewhere else. Some have that energy, some have that energy, right? I can just simply split that to any ratio I want, right? Now, let's say, let's say I reduce this number of electrons to one, right? I reduce the energy of my circuit such that I have only one electron oscillating inside. Right? What would you say now? If I go and measure it, I will still see the same thing. I still have energy either, either going from there to there, right? But now, if I ask what happens here, what would you say? I cannot split my electron in half. So you can't say, oh, half of the energy is there, half of, or half of the electron is there, half of the electron is there, right? This is the basic core concepts when you try to go from the classical to quantum mechanics, right? You reduce the energy of the system to a single quantum of energy with a single particle, and you get very close to quantum okay? And now if I sit here and ask, how do you describe the energy? Is it in a state zero or a state one? The only way you can say is that, oh, it's either zero or one. And because it's a single particle, usually we use this symbol, the ket symbol to say, oh, is here or there, maybe with some probability is here, with some probability is there. But in total, I have only one part, right? In other words, alpha squared plus beta squared is gonna be one. The total probability is one. Right? I only have one electron, right? So this is what we call a cube. There are different manifestations of the cube. It could be LC circuit, could be many different things you can build that kind of system. Right? I have a two-level system. Any any quantum mechanical system that is two-level and has that, and the energy is so low that you can see quantization. You can think about that as a cube as quantum mechanical system. Any questions so far? So not any everything I say is very accurate, right? Because uh, I'm just trying to simplify things a lot. Right, but to some extent, you can you can accept things like. Could the state of the cube be like thought of as like a random variable, and we try to like um, calculate the um, estimation of um, like the overall state, or like how much it might be, like those. It really depends on what you measure, right? <clears throat> if I if I always sit here right and ask where, where is my, my electron right i say i don't know it's somewhere it's there or there but you ask no 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 i really need to know where is the electron you can't tell me it's either there or there go and measure it find out is it is it there or there right i get my probe and go inside the circuit sometimes i find it to be inside the capacitor sometimes i find it to be inside the capacitor. like sometimes i find it to be here sometimes i find it to be there Right? In that sense, this quantum is, is, is probabilistic. It's just like tossing the coin. If some probability is going to be there, there's some probability. Right? In quantum mechanical sense, such randomness is true randomness, it's complete randomness, meaning that there's no way for you to predict whether it's going to be there or not. Right? In any other random variables classically that we have, Right? You never have that true randomness. Right? Your random number generator inside your computer, to some extent, is random. If I look at those strain of numbers for long enough time, I can predict what's going to happen. In this case, it's, it's impossible. Yes. Does that answer? Yeah. I thought that we could use that kind of like statistics like that, that is like kind of. Like predict where the you can't can predict. Well, the thing is that the, the interesting point here is that if I do a measurement, right, I, 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 I know either alpha or beta, yeah, right, to some extent. I don't know both, 
by, by a symbol by looking at it, I don't know both of them. If I repeat that measurement a thousand times, I know alpha and beta. But that means for you to know your state, what is it? You need to do that measurement a thousand times. Mm -hmm. That's why accessing information becomes harder. Mm -hmm. right? It's not like a transistor is here or it's on right. or it's off. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why uh, you, there's always that degree of uncertainty. Everything is probabilistic. Everything is just, you need to you need to do a lot of measurement for you to find out what is the, the, the state. Good. So this this one and this one, right? You can go from there to there and build your cube. There's a small difference, but there instead of just having the capacitor and the inductor. You have a nonlinear inductor, meaning that in addition to that inductor, you, you add what we call the Josephson junction, right? I don't need to explain that. I won't explain that here. It's not, it's not that critical to what I'm going to talk about later, right? But it's just to know that these two are not identical. It's not just reducing the energy and you get your cubic. You need to make a slight other difference, a slight other changes to your circuit to go from there. Once you do that, if you also want to make sure there's no R or resistance, you can go to a superconducting region. You lower the temperature of your circuit where you don't have any, any resistance. Right? Now you have a cube. Now we can start building many of these and try to connect it and build the computer. I'll talk about that later. Good. So that's basically in one slide, I told you what is superposition, what is a qubit, what is uh, the oscillation. This kind of oscillation, when you go to a single particle limit or single electron limit, is called Rabi oscillation. Almost you see that, that kind of oscillation or that kind of name in, in many, many quantum mechanical papers. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. The same thing, right? What I've shown here, uh, the energy level of that circuit, right? So the energy level of the, ele the electron, when depending on how many electrons or what is the frequency, the frequency of oscillation for an LC circuit is what? Yeah. Omega is the square root of LC, right? So I can play with that and change the energy. So that's just a different representation of that. Right? These are the energy level of that circuit. When you go to very low energies, then you start to see this discrete discretization of energy. Energy is either that or that. There's, there's no somewhere in between, based on the same thing we talked about. Right? Some, there's no somewhere in between, either there or that. That means quantization. That's where the main quantum mechanics comes from. Right? Now, I have this uh, C circuit. I can connect it to a voltage, space, for example and play with the, with the probability of uh, the electron being in that area between these two. I call it an island, but right? it's an isolated from the rest. By changing the voltage there, I can change the probability of electron being there or not, right? Depending on how many electrons I have there or there, I can call, if n electrons are here, I call it zero. If n plus one electrons are there, I call it one. It's just pure definition. I call zero and one. These are the two states of my bit, bits of my qubits. Right? Depending on how you build your circuit, then this definition could be. But this is basically what you see in, 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 uh, as a qubit. And then I can take these two levels and make this even simpler and show the whole thing with this. This is called a two level system or two energy level. I can ignore the rest of the world because I only talk about this. My energies are so low, right? Or interaction are such that I only need to take, I only need to consider these two energy levels, zero and one. I call it zero and one, I ignore the rest of the world. Going back to your, to your question, right? Here, I ignore the rest. The reason I can do that is because 
the energies I'm, I'm injecting to the system has a, has an energy of each omega or frequency of omega, and that omega is exactly equal to that. Omega. So the only interaction that can happen is between this external world and this. So I can ignore the rest of the world. That way, I don't need to do solve wave equations. I can simplify it down to a two level system and do the math. Sometimes, if you want to explain some of the physics, you need to include that. But at a very simplified level, you don't. So now that you have this two level system, it's just like a vector, right? And that's why you can do, you just use vector algebra and, and matrix multiplication to understand quantum mechanics. If you think I'm doing, I'm saying something uh, that may cause misconception, then. <laughs> How does the concept of electron excitation come into play? The, the concept of electron excitation. So apparently, when you, you supply the system with energy, it's probably going to lead to like electron moving inside. So how does that fit into the explanation of energy? Right. So if I apply a voltage here, right, I can change the amount of electrons that I right, that, that hop from this here to that. Like here, there is a barrier, and, and that's what I mean by Joseph's injunction. There is an insulating barrier. When you apply a voltage, you, you give electron enough energy to hop from there to there. Right? So now, if I measure the number of electrons that are here, right? It could be it could be a thousand, it could be a hundred electrons, or hundred, uh, could be ten electrons or eleven electrons. If it's ten electrons, I call it a state zero. If it's eleven electrons, I call it a state. Right? And now I can change my voltage such that it's not 10 or 11, it's somewhere between 10 and 10. Right? Or it could be zero electron or one electron. Right? I can make it deterministic, it's always zero or one, or I can make it, if you remember that oscillation, right? I can change the interaction time or voltage or whatever to go somewhere in between. Right? And that way I create a superposition of zero and one. Superposition of having one electron inside that island or two, or zero electron and one electron. That's why I say here n is the number of electrons that are here, and n plus one is the number that are here. And there's an energy needed to go from there to there that you can supply the background. Right? And I just define it to be zero and one. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Why do we still have a, a binary system? Why don't we just carefully design a, a 10 level system which extends the combination of states? Well, in principle, you can. It would be very, very difficult to understand what that is. Right? So the thing here is that if I have, uh, if, I, if I go back to 1940, right, if you look at the, the Turing machine, like the Turing machine would say that okay, it can do any computation with zero and one. But the, the basis zero and one is a complete basis to do any computation, right? A bit zero and a bit one is the fundamental unit of information, right? Yes, you can, you can expand your computational basis. The question is for what price, right? If you do that, the, the interaction becomes so complicated that you can't really predict what's happening. If I, from the, from the physics language, your Hilbert space becomes so big that you don't understand what's what you're doing, right? Because you don't have one qubit that has 10 levels. You have 1,000 qubits and each qubit has 10, 10 levels. Then it's impossible to understand what is really happening. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please ask with any questions. Anything you can ask. I don't have to go through all of this slide. I just want to make sure that you know some of these concepts. And so we can we can we can make it we can find a difference between classical systems and quantum systems or classical computing at least in quantum. Well, quantum well, sure. yeah. 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 Yeah.
first one. That's the laser. That makes sense. Uh, right. Yeah. So now you know, let me tell you what do we mean by entangled, right? So far we talked about superposition, right? But the word that you hear a lot is entangled in, in quantum, uh, in, in general about quantum, right? You see about entanglement, if you search entanglement on YouTube, they, they will show you a lot of videos about how, how superficial entanglement is or how crazy that concept is and things like that, right? And the reality is it's difficult to explain entanglement based on the classical analogies that we have, right? But I want to try that in it. Imagine that, that there are twins, right? You want to do some twin study. You look at the height of twin one and look at the height of twin two, right? And you make that graph. We do this measurement over hundreds, one thousands of twins that you get in the high right? You see that there's good correlation, right? Because they are twins. They are, these are identical twins. Right? If, I, if I know the height of twin one, with good uh, accuracy, I can predict the height of twin two, correct? To some extent, right? So I can make that line and I call this correlation. Correlation means that if I know one, I can predict that, right? So you might say, okay, mm, the height of twin one is 170 centimeters. And I ask, okay, what is the height of twin two? You would say it's hun around 100 centimeters. And they say, okay, that's not good enough. How exactly? Because I don't know. It's 170 plus minus two centimeters. I don't know. Right? That uncertainty is the difference between classical and quantum mechanical correlation. Right? In classical systems, that uncertainty is there no matter what. Not just twins, but any perfect system that you can make is always uncertain. And there's no way around that. Right? More accurately, we call it vacuum fluctuation or quantum fluctuation. But this is always there. Any flux. So if you take, if if you take a detector, right, a perfect detector, absolutely perfect detector, go all the way to the end of the universe where there is absolutely no noise, and you start to do measurement, you will see noise around us. Let's say you measure nothing, right? You measure electromagnetic field in a space. You see some fluctuation around. That is vacuum fluctuation. And you have two detectors, this vacuum fluctuation would be uncorrelated. That's what I mean by this kind of fluctuation I have. Quantum mechanically, I can make a twin. Let's say these twins could be two particles, two LC circuit, right? If I know the intensity of one, I can predict the intensity of the other one better than any class. If you do that, you have a quantum mechanical entanglement to some extent, right? The question is, how do I make that happen, right? You need to have two of these particles, either two electrons, two photons, whatever, and make them interact and make them such that they, they, they see each other, they sense each other. And such that if I, if I now know the property of one, I can predict the property of the other one with very high uncertainty, with very high uncertainty. They, they have to come out from the same source, from the same apparatus, from the same thing. Everything has to be perfect. So when you go to a very low energy level, that, that is possible. Right? At a very high energy level, our classical world, that's very hard to see that. When you go to a very low energy level, single electron, single photon, then you start to see that kind of thing. So there's, there's quantum computing only gives you two electrons, no, so the quantum, for quantum computing, think about this, that I have transistors, right? That's one, one way you can think about that. Similar, to, somewhat similar transistors that you have in your computer, but these are single electron transistors, for example, right? I have many of these. And more of these you can entangle together, the higher would be your computational power. This, this is a little bit easier to believe if I think that it's about the many body problems, mm -hmm. one of them, is it related to that? And right now, we're not talking about many, but right now we're just talking about, yeah. you can take this concept and, and, and say, oh, if I, have, if I have 100 particles entangled, then what happens? Oh, right? so, so in this instance, it's just a two body problem. 
So it's just a two body problem here. And so put it, put it this way, I have these two electrons and I ask, okay, what is the phase or, or whatever the property of this electron? Is it up or down? And then you say, okay, this is up or down, right? And I, I do it again. Okay, what about this? Two? What about this? Two? What about this two? And then you start to make that graph. But if you have 1000, then you need to have a different graph. There's different measurement you need to do to understand whether you have entanglement between 100 problems. But this is just between two, just to see. Uh, with classical mechanics, you have some degree of uncertainty. Uh, with quantum mechanics, you have less, but you still have like there is some minute amount, right? So it's not zero. It's not. It's not zero, and 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 in practice, is it's, it's just it could be just below the class limit, all right? There's a range here, and yes, there is how good that correlation can be. Right? But if it's less than classical correlation, you call it on. Right. That's not the only, that's not the uh, necessary and sufficient condition to say you have entanglement, right? But that's one way to explain it. That's the Yes, Yeah, it's So let me just see if I have uh, over here. Let me see. Let me just quickly go over your slide. So these are different companies who make different qubits. Google makes qubit out of superconducting qubits. This is IMQ makes qubit out of atoms, and so on and so forth. I didn't have time to talk about the, the qubit, uh, the, the gate operation, but the gate operation is basically manipulating one qubit. And if I have a qubit, if I go from a state zero to somewhere between zero and one, that's called the qubit operation. Right? And, and things like that. So let's go down. I just want to make sure that uh, yeah. So maybe that one. This is a physical. This is an actual quantum computer or processor, for example, right? So what you have here are now C circuits, and this is the Joseph and John. Right? You have many of these qubits, right? And you can make them connect via that line, and then you can say, okay, I can. You can make this to entangle. But I can make this entangle. I can make the three entangle. I can do qubit operation by applying a volt meter and RF signal to my qubit, right? And this is at the very at the surface. That's how uh, quantum computing works at least for this. Point. For ions, it's more complicated. It's different, and I won't get to that. But maybe in, in another meeting, I can talk about some other platform that we can do quantum computation for gate operation. Any questions? Was that helpful? Yeah. You want to uh, take it from here? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi. Uh, right. So now comes the practical part to get things done. How do we get started? Last last session we mentioned something about having multiple different platforms that you guys can look at that you guys will get an experience in and see which one works for you. One of them was Microsoft Azure, and the other one was a platform provided by QCI. So I'm going to introduce the QCI platform to you. So so the idea that QCI takes the idea that QCI takes is let's say. I mean, we want to know how to handle quantum programming, right? We want to program computers to do some stuff for us. Uh, when we're talking about classical computers, we learn how to code, right? And if there was machine code, like low-level code, and then eventually now you're coding using different languages, Java, C++, Python, and whatnot. Similarly, analogous to that, there is a way to program a quantum computer, right? It's not exactly the same way, but obviously, if we're building on the principles of how bits change, instead of bits, now we have qubits. Qubits are going to have some special um, special functions, like, for example, gate operations that Dr. Sandy was just uh, hitting at. And so you need to know how to program that stuff. If you really get down to it, there are multiple languages. By the way, Qiskit is a, uh, um, is a language that IBM uses. It's, it's one way to do this thing. But the idea of uh, QCI was, that we don't want to 
get too much into detail. We don't want to make things complicated. We want to stay at a higher level. So what you want to do is that we already know. It's like we do not want to reinvent the wheel. Everyone should not be reinventing the wheel altogether. Why should everyone learn an entirely new set of language? So what you want to do is you want to deal with problems classically. You want to see how you can solve them classically on a classical computer. And through their uh, software API, or whatever you call it, you can, with just one function command, you can send those inputs to, uh, and they are going to do the tough work for you. They are going to translate that and they are going to be able to translate and then upload it on the quantum computer, run it on the QPU, which is a quantum processing unit, get the results and give you the results back. So all that messy stuff, they kind of put a barrier between you and that kind of extraction level. Because one way of thinking about it is, is yes, there's one thing, if you want to understand how to you know, do bit operations for the heck of it, and you really get down in it, like how do you do this, you want to understand in full detail, show the ways to do that. But if, let's say you can't expect, like, like everyone uses computers, like a lot of people code right now, right? Not every one of them knows exactly the circuitry in a computer or you know, how, how things are going about in the computer. They don't exactly, you don't expect everyone to be a physicist in quantum mechanics to be able to use a quantum computer. So they are increasing the level of abstractness so that everyone can use it for practical sense. If you just want to utilize it, instead of learning the entire theory behind it, why not find a way to use it, okay? So what they do is they just use Python, okay? Simple Python, and they have nice libraries that they use with Python. And for that, they'll have, they, they've made a package, they get a package installed, and you can program and run it. A couple of pointers before that. Their system is uh, for optimization, right? Uh, they, it solves optimization problems. And particularly, I'll share a, a resource with you. It's, they call it Cubo Quadratic Unconstrained Optimization. Uh, what, what optimization problem would be if, let's say, you say, okay, I'm at Berg and I want to get to, uh, I want to get dominoes next to the K circle, right? And there are different ways I can do that. There, I can take different buses. I can take, you know, uh, I can walk, no big deal. Or I can like uh, grab, a, you know, grab a lift from my friend, something like that. So when, when you're thinking about that in real life, what are you thinking? you realize, okay, I want to get from here to here. That is my objective, right? The constraints are, if I'm feeling tired, I, don't, I, would prefer, I wouldn't prefer walking, right? If it's time limit, I want to get there with that time. So there are some constraints and you see, and you, your brain processes it and you see, okay, what's the best solution to get my objective within these constraints, right? That's called an optimization problem. And there are more mathematical subtleties to it. What kind of problem is like, quadratic unconstrained optimization and then there's theory about convex problems or not but we're giving you simple problems and what you can do is look at these problems and you can break them down into little mathemat mathematics right what variables are at play and how you can think of that problem write it as a math couple of equations and send that equation code that and send that to the qpu and it's gonna run it and it's gonna give you your possible answers along with which one is, you know, if you wanna say, okay, this one fulfills my constraint the best. And there are times when there are multiple options. There are multiple options. Maybe sometimes they're equally good or maybe sometimes one's a little better, but it's gonna give that to you. So that's the whole concept that they use QCI and their thing is catalyst to the Q. Uh, so it's like a catalyst, right? That's what they do. So to get that started uh, off, I mean, you guys can have like, um, and they, they give like a lot of problems. You, you think that these constraint optimization problems are small, they aren't, right? So what they can uh, do is uh, you can think of, like think big. Uh, the example they gave us in one of our meetings was the NFL, right? The NFL draft happens, right? Personally don't know anything about football or how that happens, okay? <laughs> Totally new to me, but let's. I, I do know it's a big deal. I have money at play and want to get the best out of it. They have some constraints, right? They have some constraints. They have some budget. They have some quota that they can't go above that. They want to get the best players for each category and see overall make the best team, right? So that itself 
is an optimization problem. I mean, if, if anyone is, it's like complex, it's complicated. If anyone is able to, you know, make a game or build a program to do that, like you better get that registered as personal property and then sell it because that, that's gonna sell. So those kind of stuff is also just train optimization problem. So that's the bigger picture they're gonna go for. And they're like, if classical computers are too, too uh, slow, right now it's, it's, a, it's a controversial term, you know, quantum supremacy or whatnot. But the idea is that theoretically classical computer is going to take this much time and practically that's not impossible, then why not use which is theoretically better, get that and get the most out of it, right? So right now, quantum computer cannot be a classical at everything, right? Right now it's still in infancy, but there's some problems where it, there is a quantum advantage. Constraint optimization can be one, okay? So which is what they use. So before that, I mean, talk a lot about it. Uh, how many of you have Python installed in your computers? Okay, quite a bit. And is there, there are a few who haven't, all right? First of all, uh, if you have any kind of Python, as long as Python 3, you should be good. If you don't, I would suggest open up internet and go to the website. Uh, if it's the first time you're doing it, just go to Anaconda, right? Anaconda.com. And it's gonna be an entire navigator. And yeah, in fact, I can share my screen so I can the URL and you can just, just download that. Are you gonna allow me, uh, Donny? Oh, okay. Do I have to switch it? No, actually, I am sure, but this one is not. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Let's open Zoom here. Yeah. Just go here and you can download it. Uh, we did, at the bottom, there's like option for uh, Linux and Mac as well. You can set that, okay? Once you have gotten that set, I mean, you're downloading it. For those people, for those people who already have it, how many of you were part of the club and know what QCI is and have their tokens? Anyone? Okay, a couple of them, yeah, a few of them. Right, so what happens is what we're trying to do is since all of you have joined our, uh, our group on Boiler Link, right? We have your email addresses. So what we're trying to do is I'm going to contact UCI and try to get your tokens, right? Because this is not something that you can just download off bad and just start using it. They, they give you a special token to get set up. So we're going to get you your tokens and after you guys, all of you have, have Python installed, and those of you who do not know this, uh, uh, who haven't been part of our club and do not know the QCI stuff, before the token, those of you who have Python installed, just run a pip install command. Let me just write it down so I don't mess up the spelling. Just go to your command prompts and pip install it. And others, just put this on download, and we'll see how long that takes. No, I just want to write it down. In fact, I'll put it on the screen. Yeah, I'll put it. I'll put it in the chat later on. Just run this command. All the small letters. And all the CS people and double in all the CS savvy people, if your peers are having trouble downloading or installing, please do help them out. Okay, I'm not just gonna debug every single thing. I'll try my best there. So, uh, have you all put uh, Anaconda to download? So downloading. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So once it sets up, we'll be prompt you guys can do the other. While the other ones, they can just if you have already have Anaconda or any form of Python, do the pip three install catalyst. And let me know when you guys have Catalyst run. Right. So the whole idea is to just get this environment set up for you. Uh, 
because if you're if, if you're not new, then you have done a couple of these problems. I'll introduce a, a potential problem and how you tackle it once you do have your tokens made. We won't be able to do that today because we're still getting your tokens made. Uh, but I will tell you how we can tackle those problems, and you'll see it's like a simple equations, and we'll just start tackling them one by one. So we play pretend it would be the workshop and have the token. Yeah, if, uh, if you have, yeah, if you yeah. attend the women engineering uh, workshop, yeah, you should be able to have the token. Yeah, and, QCI uh, provided. Other others can there token next week. Okay, okay. I'll take you get my token. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So. Let me know when most of you are set up with uh, Python as well as this installation. Oh, no, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. This is probably the one you use for your accessibility. Uh, these guys received an account of the information that that was. Oh, that was for, uh, uh, I think that was for keeping that, right? Right. So I'm not sure if tokens expire on that. I don't think so. Yeah, so, I, so they should have seen it before. Did you send them or QCI sent them? I found it. You did. We'll still come by the email address. Okay. Uh, is this your Okay, so if you had tokens previously, apparently they are expired. We'll get all of you guys new tokens for access uh, to QCI. Anyone still left installing? Okay, are we all have you all installed Catalyst? Okay, looks looks like it. right. So until until we get until we get the tokens, you won't be able to solve. Uh, you won't be able to program and solve it. Right, but let me just run you through potential prop like toy examples, things to get you started, to see how you're gonna solve it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be easy. Yeah, it's We have some set of instructions on how you guys can install, depending if you're a Mac user or a Windows user. Uh, we will I'll plan on sending you guys this course book. This is from QCI. It tells you from start to end, like, 
Yeah, it tells you from start to end what kind of uh, what, what what exactly are we dealing with. It tells you the theory and why the motivation behind it, and it tells you how to set it up. And there are some practice problem sets. There are solutions at the end of the code. Try not to look at them. Okay, don't be like me. But once you do figure it out, they're going to be like once you understand what's going on. Five lines of code for each one. Okay, so what is our potential question before we go to problem set? Let me just give you example one. It should be right. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay. okay. It should be able to see it on Zoom. Let me just see if I have any. Oh, whoa. Let me just send the installation command. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Here you go. Right. So, when we are optimizing, I think first we need to find out okay, what are the variables? Okay, what well, variables are there that we need to optimize? Okay, well, my objective depends on what parameters. Okay, so these are the parameters that you want to find the value. I, it, I want to get from hair to hair within this time. I have options of taking number 13 bus. I have option of taking, uh, I don't know, go move and connector bus. I have option of taking a 4B and walking. Multiple options, right, for the bus parameter which bus to take. And multiple options, each gives me a different result. So what I want to do is I want to run my program and find out which bus should I take, okay? Simplify, oversimplify version. Uh, which you can see, if, have anyone, has anyone heard of the NP hard problems like traveling salesman problem? People in CS and double uh, E might have heard it, right? For those who haven't, it's like, if a salesman, correct me if I'm wrong, okay. Uh, if it, it's, it's like, um, the salesman, some people try to take it into like a mailman and different kind of stuff. The concept is that it wants to get from one point to another. Okay. He has, I don't know how many, N letters to give. Okay. Hundred thousand. Any one for a number, try to understand it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure just that he travels around once. Yeah. But he wants to find out what is the shortest route. Right. So there are a lot of options that he can take. Right. But he wants to find the shortest route. And as you increase the options, the, the problem increases exponentially, right? Same thing here. What's the shortest route to get from here to Domino's uh, to get the free pizza? And that kind of stuff, again, comes in. Uh, this is how you mathematically represent it. First, figure out what are my variables. And then I write it as an equation. For example, if, if you get this equation, right, over here, x1 is one parameter, x2 is another parameter, okay? And x3 is another parameter, okay? I want a combination of these three parameters, okay? This is my objective, okay? I wanna find out, like, if I write this, think of it as y is equal to ax1 plus dx2 plus fx3, right? Think of this as a mathematical equation, you guys have seen the mathematical equation. Your output is a linear combination of these parameters. And you want to find out those parameters that minimize it. Right? A is the time it's going to take for you to take bus X1. Okay. B, D is the time it's going to take you to take bus X2. And F is the time it's going to take you to, uh, to take bus X3. So one option is you get x is equal to x1 is 1, all the rest are 0, which means just take bus x1. How much time? A. A to x, right? So this tells you, this kind of like scales my options, like weighs my options. What are my options? What's the best combination to minimize what I want to do? Now, and, and from programming aspects, we don't just solve them linearly. We don't use programs to just uh, Lin, uh, linear algebra solver or Sam solve them as Samson's equations. What we do is we solve the matrices, okay? We convert them, we transform them into matrices, and then we send that objective matrix, okay? Our objective function, we don't send an objective function, we don't send an objective equation, 
we send an objective matrix. So how do you transform this into your matrix? Um, if, if you want to, uh, I mean, it's pretty much self, uh, not self match, okay. Hey, people want to use that term. Okay, think of, think of it this way. It's like X1, X2, and X3 at each column, at each rows, X1, X2, and X3 at each column, right? So like label, make a matrix, see how many variables there are. Over here, there are three variables, and we want a square matrix. So that's like nine, uh, three by three matrix. Okay. If let's say there are four variables, I would want a four by four matrix. Right? Pretty, pretty simple to keep track of. Because what we want to do is we want to make a symmetric matrix. They are easy to solve. They are easy to optimize. Okay. The whole point is optimizing, taking less time, being efficient. Is there other ways to solve it? Definitely. Is there many other ways? Definitely. Are they the most efficient one? Hmm, arguably not. So what we want to do is we want to make a nice, clean, square matrix, which is symmetric. Everyone understands what a symmetric matrix is? If you don't, I'm sure I can explain. There's no issue there. So what we want to do is, OK. So when, now, when, when, you, when you see a variable just by itself, x1, this just means it's x1, x1 location. Coordinates, OK? This x1 is going to be at coordinate x1 and x1, which is x1, x1 over here. If it's just x2, it's going to be at coordinate x2, 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 x2. Similarly for that, right? This, these ones are pretty simple. So what you want to understand is why not, why isn't it not even x1, x1, right? Why don't we write it as x1, x1? Why, why are we just writing it as x1? X1, X1 is just X1 squared, right? And when we're dealing with qubits, qubits are either zero or one. So if you square them, you're still gonna get zero or one, okay? So we don't, we don't, um, we don't multiply them. We don't write them as X1 into X1. It's redundant. So we just use X1 is equal to X1 squared. It's all a math equation. X1 is equal to X1 squared. You find out what are the possible answers to that equation. Just zero and one, which is what we're dealing with. So, but things get things get interesting if uh, let's see where are we? Okay. Check. Look at this example. Now that's the constraint. I'll come to the constraint later on first. I'll just look at the objective. Things are interesting when you have like what you say cross terms, right? When the terms are not just x one x one. Okay. So we have an x1, x2, x1, x3, x2, x3, right? You have those terms as well. <sighs> okay. Tell me, if this says x1 and x2, why can't, why can't it just put b here? Or x1 and x2 could also mean x2 and x1. Why not just b here? Why, why, why do I represent it like this? What do you, what do you guys think? Let's just, just look at it. Oh, it's written there. God damn it. Okay, it's, it's already in there. It's, it's supposed to be symmetric, right? So if I just put a B here and nothing here, this matrix is not going to be symmetric, matrix, right? It's going to be, uh, no, no, it's not, this is just not going to be symmetric. So what we, what we do is we divide it equal. X1 and X2 has two possible locations X1, X2, or X2, X1. So we just divide them between the two. Similarly, x1 and x3 have two possible locations. We divide it there. Similarly, x2 and x3, we divide it there as well. So when you have just simple x1 and x2, you know they're going to be on the diagonals, right? And when you have these cross terms, right? this is just on the diagonals. See that? But these are just cross terms. These cross terms are going to be off diagonal and you equally divide. And that's how you make up your objective matrix, right? So that is our, that is the objective. That is the objective we're trying to minimize. Okay, that's the one that we want to optimize. We want to get the best solution for that. Sometimes you don't have a constraint, right? Sometimes I just get me from here to home. I don't care how, I don't care how long it takes, how much it costs us to go home, right? Yeah, so 
sometimes you don't have an object you constrain you just say objective constraints are zero 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 no constraints solve it you can solve that the other way is if you have some constraints and let's say my constraint is dx2 plus e dx2 is equal to minus e an easy way to understand is is i, I have just random equation x1 x2 random equations and i say there can be any value for x1 right and any value for x2 but i want those values that add up to one x1 plus x2 is equal to one now x1 and x2 cannot just have any value there's a constraint on it right so those are that's how you model your constraints that was a mathematical interpretation real life interpretation again with the bus example my constraints are that yes i can take just one route i can just take combination of routes but all the root buses root times add up should not be more than 30 minutes that is my constraint what's the best i can do with that so that's that's the constraint you think of it uh conception in the real world you model that into mathematics you write it into an equation you transform that equation into a matrix now some rules like we made a symmetric matrix for the objective function the rules for a constraint matrix is that first of all bring everything on one side and put it equal to zero this is dx2 is equal to minus e don't write it like that just bring everything to one side make the other side zero okay once you have that your one constraint yeah why do you require the objective matrix to be connected uh, easier to solve like for example the programmers that are going to solve it it's easier symmetric matrix that are easier to solve so once you have that right once you have everything to the left hand side and right hand side is zero you see your constraint equation can be with one equation and then it's just going to be a vector or it can be two equations and it's going to be a matrix the idea is let's say if the equation was dx2 plus e is equal to zero I will not write D and E. I will have to write a zero here because there is no constraint on X1. It's zero X1. I always have to maintain order. I always have to stay, you know, follow the notation. Right? First variable, second variable, third variable, how many variables, and then a constant, and then zero. Okay. Similarly, like this. This one is BX1, CX2, and a constant A. This could be bx1 plus cx2 is equal to minus a, like I said, x2 plus x2 is equal to one. But I take everything on the left hand side, write it in order, and I can have one constraint equation. If this was just my constraint equation, this would be my matrix. That's can't do that with projector. Okay, so you just put like like zero de as an equation. If you have two, you have this. If there was another constraint, there would be another row. Now you don't care if it's a symmetric, if it's a two by three, three by three, you don't care about that now. This is your constraint matrix. Okay, the objective one has to be square, symmetric, the constraint one doesn't. Right? So once you have the constraint matrix done, what you can do is you can pass it and let me see if I have questions. Okay, so far so good. Uh, so you can pass it and you can solve it and it's going to do the solving for you. I'm going to take you to Problem number two, I'm going to run you through the solution. Ideally, we wanted to run it on a laptop. Until we have the tokens ready, you can't run it on the laptop. A lot of you people have already done it who were with us before. I'll, I'll do what they call a dry run. I'll take you to the code. I mean, is everyone familiar how to write Python? Are, are there any uh, are there, are there people here who don't know how to write Python? Trust me, if you are, you're not alone. Right? Yeah, it's okay. So the good thing is Python is one of the easier ones programming language compared to the ones out there like C, C++, hash, and you're gonna learn QHash for the Microsoft one. So it's more functional program, right? So basically program libraries are made just to find out, okay, you can just go online, how to do this in Python. Yeah, then you're done. You just find out the programs in there if, if, if you're learning, I mean, Obviously, you know the syntax and all that stuff before. I would suggest there are really good free Python tutorials there online. You, you can just take one of them, and it's really easy to catch up to them. 
I will run you through and I'll tell you what each line is doing just so you understand the simple process of optimizing it. Yes, you can solve these simultaneous equations by hand on paper, keep on going. Maybe you'll be able to solve two of them, but what if your objective gets like nine by nine matrix with five constrained equations? It's gonna take you a long time. So that, that's where the quantum advantage comes in. I mean, classical computer can still solve it. The idea is for difficult problems, a QP will be able to do it faster for a special set of problems. So let's just run through one problem here and we'll be done because I feel like I'm talking too fast and just throwing a lot at you. It's gonna take some time to absorb. Okay, uh, let me see which. And by the way, if you get what I'm saying, if you understand these basic principles, and we will try to get you the tokens before, there's no more to it. Like I would like to be you know, cool and say, oh, we're just getting started in this complex. No, there, there is no more to it. You just find more. The next part is figuring out what problems can be optimized. Okay, figuring out, okay, these are, this is an optimization problem. How do I write it down in a matrix? What are my variables? Identifying that. Once you're done, same process. Right. So that's, that's the fun part. So you you guys, I highly recommend you guys attend the webinar by QCI. They are doing it for you guys and for exactly the same thing. They'll maybe run through live problems as well, answer some questions that you might have, and you'll be able to understand all of it. It's like now you up to speed. Sorry guys who had joined us before, but they're up to speed now, but you did not get the quantum advantage. Okay. So Sample problem. How do I show you sample problem? Okay, the problem was that x1 plus 2x2 plus x1, x2, right? This was our sample problem. This was our objective function, okay? So now we code now. This is, this is the sample problem. There were no constraints, right? So what we do is, if you're familiar with Python, you'll know, but if you don't, those don't. First, at every start of every code, you got to import the libraries that you're going to need. This is the catalyst, which you all have recently installed. And from, like, it's like English, like from catalyst, you're gonna import Q core, which, which you're gonna use. And then from, this is library already in Python, NumPy. Uh, sorry, you're just gonna import NumPy as NP, which just means you're gonna later on refer to it as NP, right? So you define a function, you find a function that you're gonna do, and you can name anything, you can write anything there. Your objective matrix, is that you make an array, right? You make an NP array, this is how you make an array. And what is the array? This is a matrix, okay? This array is a matrix. These first, this, this is the first row, this is the second row. Look at that, X1, that means the diagonal first entry is one, right? And there's two X2, so the second diagonal is two, right? X1, two X2, and there's X1, X2. So what we do, we split it half, half, right? cross terms, x1, x2, we split it as half, half. That is our objective matrix. This is how you write in code. And this is the main solver. This is it. This is your entire optimization. That's it. That, that's a QC data. You write this, you get a solution. You don't have a constraint right now. You write this, you have a word Q core. So from Q core, this is your sample. Q core dot sample underscore Q goal. And you pass your objective matrix to it. This is their function, their library. They have done all the complicated stuff. You pass your objective matrix. See, okay, this is my objective matrix. This is my objective matrix. I've done all the hard work. Take it away. Send it to them. Your responses are stored in response, and you have the answer. Now, like I said, there could be multiple solutions, right? Like, so I'm just. This is going to just print every solution, like solution one, two, three. There could be multiple solutions. And this is gonna answer your solutions and that's about it. Right, um, I might introduce you. Oh yeah, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I can share my screen. I should have a lot of people complaining in the chat. Oh, there weren't. Ah, okay. So uh, now the concept of energy is basically what, it, they're going to give you, okay, this is the solution, and this is the energy of the solution. This is solution number two. This is the energy of solution number two. What does the energy mean? Think of it as penalty, okay? 
if my constraint is 100% satisfied, right? The constraint, remember we put constraints equal to zero, right? All the equations. So you have the value of the objective, like y is equal to x1 plus x2, and they give you these are the x1, x2. You put that in, it's y plus some penalty, and penalty is multiplied by the object, uh, by the constraint. So if that those solutions satisfy your constraints, constraint is going to be zero, zero penalty, right? If they don't satisfy your constraint, there's going to be some extra penalty. So the energy term tells you, okay, you can look at the energies and see which one has the most or the least penalty. So which kind of solution do you want? I think of penalty as I can get here from here to there, but it might cost me this. Taking a bus might cost me this. Ordering an Uber might cost me this. Walking, I can consider that a penalty is going to take long more time. These are penalties. So yes, there are multiple solutions. Every solution has a trade-off. Yes, you can optimize it. There's never a win-win situation. Every situation, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta win some, you lose some, you gotta get this trade-off. Energy sort of tells you, okay, this solution gives you this much energy. You see, okay, these are my possible solutions, which energy, and these are the energies. I'll make the judgment, right? They don't do that for you. They're like, we give you all the options. You decide which one do you want. So it's very diverse, uh, very dynamic, sorry, in that sense. And if, let's say we had a constraint Right. If, if there was no constraint, by the way, this is an alternative way to solve it. There is no constraint. You can just make constraint matrix of zero, 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 and send it in. Right. Sample constraint problem, and it's simple as that. You send the objective as well as the constraint, but the constraint is zero, so it doesn't matter. If a different problem comes in, and now we have the constraint, right? This is a problem. We could say this is my objective. Same as before, x1 plus 2x2 plus x1, x2. And now my constraint, I have a constraint which says, I mean, I'll show you the question, where is the thousand constraint? So you guys understand what the questions look like. Yeah, look at problem two. My objective function is x1 plus 2x2 plus x1, x2. My constraint is 2x1 plus 2x2 is equal to two. Remember, what are you gonna do first? Take the two to the left side. It's going to be two x one plus two x two minus two, and we know we can just write that as a two two minus two, right? That that is our constraint matrix. So it just comes out to be like this. Look at my constraint. It's just a matrix with a single row of two two and minus two. Objective is the same. I do the same again. Everything is done in this line. You send the objective, you send the constraint, you get solutions, you print out, out, print out all possible solutions and energies, and you pick the one which you like. Now, any questions about that? I should be asking more questions. Yeah, I should be rushing. So following me seems pretty simple. Brain that obvious is the term you guys would use. Not there again. Okay. Uh, all right. So once you have that. Have a look at these problems. You see this problem one and two? Now look at problem three. What happens? Function. Now two constraints. Same method. Write a constraint matrix that a function matrix solve it. This was supposed to be a harder one. Three constraints. Function. Solve it. Simple as that. Some of these ones, like let's say this one, uh, there's some of them are more difficult and then this problem is to be solved in a QPU. Like here, you can see the advantage of using the QPU because some of them might not have clear answers. Like the one problem that we gave you, problem one and two, they have clear answers. This is how the answers will look like. Like this, zero, zero. X one, zero, X two, zero. And the next one is gonna also look like something similar here, but this constraint, right? Now it can't be zero, zero because two X one plus two X two has to be equal to two. So now, it's x1 is equal to 1 and x2 is equal to 0. This is a new solution with that constraint, right? So this is how solutions are going to look to you. And find complicated ones, just this is one clear solution. Sometimes you don't get one solution, sometimes you get multiple. That's where the concept of energies comes in, multiple options. You can choose which path you want to take, which path suits you. That's the whole point of optimization. It's more fun if you, you know, programming and getting into it, like see the problems 
code and get an answer. Maybe it's a blessing in disguise. You guys don't have your tokens yet. You'll get your tokens. We'll, we'll try to get them to you ASAP. And then you guys can practice some of this stuff. Uh, I'll make sure how to get you these problems. Or you can just come up with fun problems on your own. Like how hard will those equations? Just come up with some equations and constraints and see that. These are going to be your toy problems to get you started, right? Obviously, the principle and concept, like I said, that's about it. This is all it's going to take. How you can get more complicated is that you realize, okay, uh, now I look at a harder world, real life world problem, how to translate that. So that's where the difficulty arises. How to translate the problem, real uh, world, real life problem, to uh, an optimization problem. Once you do that, then you just gotta write those few lines of code. Okay, all good? That board, yeah, okay. that board you use. It's daunting, I hope not. Okay, I, I guess we, yeah, we're two minutes early. That time that, okay. So that, that, that was it, that's gonna, that was it for this uh, week's meeting. I think the QCA seminar is two, from week after the next? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll email you and be sure to attend that. You guys will be able to follow that more stuff. And hopefully next time, either we'll get this sorted and we'll take it from here, or we'll give you a similar introduction to the Microsoft platform. Okay, and then you can see which one suits you. And there are different platforms with different problems, and you can see what's going on. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Please have the pizza that's left. Uh, okay.